Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Beckett, for that very lovely introduction. Can you just confirm you hear me? Can yeah. you? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I'd also like to extend a thank you to the organizers of this conference for inviting me. This is quite an honor. And of course, I want to say thank you to the, all the attendees who have held out and you're still here on the third day. I know that it's been intense and you can just imagine and I'm, wow, what stamina, stamina I'm, I'm in all. So um, thank you, everyone. I'm just going to start the share here. Okay. Okay, everyone can see my screen now? Okay, good. All right, um, I'm not going to present a study. Uh, what I'm going to present, I'm not going to present a study or a data. Uh, after the invitation, what I was thinking, I was thinking about what could I talk about? And I thought, well, it's the third day. Uh, you've got to have data and studies coming out your just rolling out of your brains right now. So what I propose to do today at the end of this conference, the third day, is more of a dialogue, which is as much with myself as with you, members of the audience, regarding where I, AI might take us as educators in the future. How I want to do, look at, do it is by looking first at predictions of its impact, predictions about AI, that is, as well as making sort of a, a comparable look at the way in which another venue that's very dear to my heart, which is virtual ex a, a virtual exchange, um, kind of looking at the trajectory of the virtual exchange in language teaching and learning to see if we can pull out some, some patterns uh, in, relative to AI. So with that in mind, Okay, let's try to imagine a young student of 12 now in 2044, how will her children's education, how will her children's education be? So what I've pulled together are three different predictions for 2045 from three different sources. And I'm going to uh, ask you to play your a little game here, just a little bit of a challenge. See if you can figure out which each of these come from a different group of experts and see if you can figure out or a different group of source, see if you can figure out where they come from as I explain them to you. So we're going to start with this first group of uh, pool of resources and their predictions. OK, this is Panorama, Panorama One. So prediction. Online and hybrid formats. So technology will enhance the traditional classroom. We'll have new ways to explain topics and all of this with the help of AI. Teachers and tutors will have support, engage and emphasize, but a lot of learning will be self-guided. There is even a prediction that there will be the demise of physical buildings. Although I, as a mother and a grandmother, do not believe that. I think that at least primary school will always exist because parents need a place to put their children. So I don't know about the, the demise of physical buildings myself. Another prediction, personalized learning. School curriculums will be unbundled. They'll be become bespoke, more tailored curriculums, uh, innovative delivery formats. And of course, all of this with the support of AI. One minute, I forgot to turn on my clock. I wanna make sure that I'm on time. Okay, so another equity of access. Um, what with the internet becoming universal, hopefully the access, internet access will become, a, is declared as a universal or universal right. We'll talk about whether that is a reality or not later on. Um, with this internet access and the support of online AI supported learn, uh, digital education platforms, the prediction is that there'll be a greater democratization and more flexibility in training. Another prediction, teachers will take put more priority on social and emotional learning so that students will learn to thrive in the workplace. We'll have skills such as creativity, collaboration, communication, problem solving. These will become essential as well as building and maintaining relationships with community, not just online communities, but also in-person community. We've all seen as teachers, the impact that the COVID pandemic had on social relationships. So this, is, this has become 
uh, something that's become sort of in the forefront of priorities for education. And of course, students need to learn to tolerate ambiguity and rapid change. There'll be new methods of responding to society. Um, society, social political world is changing. We're seeing it in front of our eyes. A lot of us are living this. And so educators have to think how they can best prepare young learners um, for these changing, these shifting paradigms in, social, in the social political world. And there will also be in, in more immersive, more interactive um, situations, learning situations. Uh, a lot of these with AI immersive bots, these already exist. Uh, there's a prediction that three, 3D printers will replace, will become the new pencils and paper, shall we say. And that uh, the focus will be on bringing students' ideas to life, encouraging innovation from a very young age. Okay, so that is, scenario one, okay? Let's see other predictions. Predictions, we have eight predictions this time, but you'll see several of them are quite similar. Again, immersive VR and AR technology will become much more integrated in the classroom. Again, in some cases supported with AI, holographic teachers in the classroom. That's another prediction. Um, maybe geographically distanced holographic lessons as well. Students engaging together, uh, working on holographic images. Some of this is already taking place nowadays. Uh, the prediction is that it will be much more common. As we saw before in the other predictions, AI will drive personalized learning experiences. It will build on analyzing rapid data analysis. It's a little bit tinge of big brother here that makes me a little bit uncomfortable, but um, we're seeing it already. Um, it's something that needs to be dealt with. Another one, global class classroom networks. Schools will be interconnected. There'll be global collaboration, maybe even a global digital curriculum, standardized essential learning outcomes. This is another prediction. Smart learning places. We had a prediction in the other one that the classroom was gonna disappear. Here, the prediction is that the classrooms are gonna be, become smart, that they will be, will have haptic devices, wearable devices, so that they're, they're more sensory. Uh, and also AI, again, collecting data and tailoring that data to uh, different states and different physio uh, and cognitive states of the students. Enhanced multimodal learning, that one's related to the last one, this biometric feedback. It'll be multisensory, auditory, visual, kinesthetic, even olfactory. Uh, if I'm an agricultural student, I'm not sure I'm too pleased about that one, but you know, in some circumstances that not, might not be so pleasant, but we, the, these are predictions, right? Flexible and lifelong learning. We saw this in the other prediction. This will often be supported by AI. And also there'll be micro credentials to get the recognition for these self person, these personalized learning experiences that, that students are taking part in. Sustainable and inclusive. And uh, the uh, idea that um, it will be inclusive for all learner needs uh, is, is, is included in this, as well as the schools themselves and the way that the, the education is delivered will be more sustainable. And gamification, this is already here, but it will be much more sophisticated, very sophisticated edu educational games, maybe even mainstream, maybe will be a blend of education with entertainment that, that will be just um, an, sent right into the, the homes. Uh, so, and of course, many of, the, many of these platforms would be supported through AI, these resources. So that is scenario two. Let's have a look at scenario three. And this one, we've got five predictions. We've got the prediction of bionic enhanced learning. So implanted chips, learning really doesn't even need to take place because what you need to know is already implanted in your head. So if you, the teacher needs, the student needs to switch to maths, he just switches, uh, science switches to learn about chemistry, maybe AI chips, not sure about that prediction. Holographic tools, holographic books, for example, the book will talk, 
sing, even dance, maybe have sparkles when something goes wrong, you know, special effects. So one would assume that these were maybe probably AI generated holograms. So quest based learning, very similar to the gamification prediction we saw earlier. Not teachers, Grandmaster Wizard will be leading students through solving mysteries, through quests, maybe rescue magical animals or magical creatures trapped by spells. And of course, this Grandmaster Wizard may be AI generated. Who knows? Avatar teachers. Our teachers take on the shape of whatever is needed. So Mr. Owl teaches wisdom. Mrs. Dolphin teaches marine life and Professor Lyon helps with leadership skills. And that sounds very AI to me as well. And of course, adventure capsules. So AI powered special capsules, much like the immersive um, experience that we were talking about earlier. So um, ideas that you're in a, in a capsule and you could perhaps go to different eras, go visit planets, et cetera, et cetera. It sounds pretty cool, as it says here. So, did you guess the sources of these three predictions? Did you guess for the first one, academic experts, predictions about the future coming from academic experts. Second prediction set of predictions came from AI. So, and it had the most. And, uh, I, it can be, AI can be quite verbose at times. And you probably already guessed this one, this was a group of children, a focus group, about 10, 11 year olds. These were their ideas of uh, the future education. Of course, predictions are predictions. And um, predict, however, predictions are typically based on lived experiences and information about how we see things are evolving. So we can assume that there is some intuitively sound predictions here. Uh, and I feel like it's worth looking at these predictions to see what, the, what are some similarities, because we do have a very vast different pool of, of resources for these predictions uh, to see, uh, to perhaps look at um, some of these predictions and what they have in common. So as we can see, Artificial intelligence does indeed have an almost outsized role in these predictions. So the integration, the holograms, the capsules, the blended and self-guided learning, the personali personalization of learning, gamification, lifelong development, uh, lifelong learning opportunities. So AI is very, very present in these predictions there. But we can also see that there are areas where AI is not so pre present. But luckily, these are areas that are not going unnoticed in our domain. These are already present. I've noticed that they're present in the, pre in the presentations and in the posters in this conference. And that is, that is, very, um, that is very, for me, an optimistic point because it means that they're not going unnoticed. This equity of access to quality education. Yes, in theory, AI could give personalized learning and everyone could learn what they really want to learn. But as it's already been pointed out in this conference by several presenters, including this keynote, if there's not equity of access to the resources, there's not equity of access in education. The local and global collaboration and cultural exchanges, these are competences that we're going to need, uh, that students are going to need. And yet, how is AI really coming into play here? But there are some pre presentations here that are talking about some global projects that bring in AI. And so that's, that, that's uh, also very motivating, inspiring to see. And social emo and emotional learning, these skills, creativity, collaboration, communication, problem solving, building, maintaining relationships, tolerating ambiguity. There are, there are some presentations, there are some posters that are focusing on how AI can actually help with this because we, you know, AI tends to create for us and, and we don't tend to think of AI as being something terribly collaborative, but there is, there are some, some uh, very interesting studies going on. And I think that it's representative in this conference. Inclusivity also, um, there needs to be more consideration of how AI, what are the languages that are, it's being trained in predominantly English. This has come up, I think, several times. And and what what are the what are the 
learner abilities that students need to have to be able to really take advantage of the this this very powerful resource. So we're back to this question, this dichotomy that is so often heard in public spaces. Is AI the genie in the bottle or the devil in disguise? I don't, really don't have the answer. Um, <laughs> consider, for instance, that this quote, uh, maybe we could just um, take a quick guess. Anyone want to guess where this quote is coming from? You can put it in the chat if you want to. Um, from a new UNESCO report. At a time when the field of education is in worldwide ferment, a single instructional phenomena has captured the attention, not only of professionals, but of laymen. Any guesses? I don't see anything in the chat, any guesses. No? I will tell you. It sounds like AI, but we are talking about a UNESCO report from 1965 about the teaching machine. So you have an, a nice image of the teaching machine here. We've all heard of the teaching machine. It's become ubiquitous, right? Not hardly. However, here are some quotes from publications about the infamous teaching machine. Some positive, some not so positive, that were made 66 years ago that for me are very resonant, very re remind me of some of the comments that you hear nowadays about a very completely different technological uh, tool, which is AI. The idea that the student will become to depend on it, that it's going to have a huge impact on teaching, that it's going to replace tr traditional method, teaching methods. So these, these were comments made about a completely different techno technological tool 66 years ago. And yet these are still quite common comments that we hear nowadays. Something else I'd like to point out. Here's something else to keep in mind, that AI has been around for some time. Uh, in 1950, Alan Turing proposes a test of, of a machine intelligence called the imitation game. In 1952, Arthur Samuel first has the first program where machine learns to play a game, which is checkers, as you can see by this picture. And in 1955, John McCarthy coins the term artificial intelligence in a summer workshop at Dartmouth. So, AI has been around for some time, but it's taken on almost a phenomenal grip on public interest. Mm -hmm. However, the time lag between technological advances and educa uh, educational uptake is well documented. And so the reaction to technological advances, sometimes it could take decades before high impact technology that is commonly used in other domains become part of teaching and learning process in public schools. And sometimes it is embraced as a silver, silver bullet solution to daunting educational crisis. And yet other times techno technology provokes public alarm. So. Consider, for example, these two comments. One this year. This comes from a headlines uh, in a in a in the Pew report, I believe. No, in the Harvard Business Review, a quarter of U.S. teachers say AI, AI tools do more harm than good in K through 12 education. That was, I think, made in March of 2024. And look what Socrates had to say about writing. Writing will create forgetfulness in the learner's souls because they will not use their memories. So technology has always been sort of a, a seen as um, a two-edged sword. It can be a silver bullet or it could be just the end of all uh, education. So now I'm going to switch lanes, okay? Um, going to now talk about technology impact on language learning, teaching and learning in one area in virtual exchange. And we're going to put our minds back to 1994. And I know many of you in the audience are too young to even, we're not even around, okay? And I'm showing that I'm a dinosaur, yes. You know, dark ages of technology and all that, but we're going to cast our minds back uh, several years, okay? In, 19, in the mid-1990s, there was an increase in access to interactivity. So in 1995, 
internet was just becoming a, a sort of a, a whisper in in the general public um and we those of us who were around re may remember this was how we communicated this was an electronic bulletin board right yes yes we 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 actually worked with this right so in 1995 just as Mark Schauer, Warshauer published one of the most recognized, he was, Mark Warshauer is one of the most recognized voices in, in uh, virtual exchange or te te uh, telecollaboration, if you like. He published a seminal guidebook called Virtual Connections. Um, around that same time that he published that book, there were calls for getting computers out of the classroom, get that demonic thing out of the classroom, right? So again, we have sort of a parallel Right. This is actually from a headline of a newspaper in Ottawa. So what I propose is a quick look at the timeline of definitions of virtual exchange. And I promise this does come back to our artificial intelligence and the topic. Uh, in 1995, as I mentioned earlier, Warshaw refers to technology enhanced exchanges as virtual exchanges, uh, connections. In 1996, Little and Bramertz talked about tandem learning, this partnership with two different mother tongues working together to learn each other's language. In 2003, Julia Belts uses the term telecollaboration, which is still quite, quite common, commonly used nowadays, uh, to talk about internationally dispersed learners of, of languages. In 2016, O'Dowd and Lewis mentioned telecollaboration, but they also say it could also refer to as virtual exchange or online inter intercultural exchange. So you see that there's the terminology is beginning to become a little bit disputed. In 2017, I stuck to my guns and in a chapter on telecollaboration, I said, no, it's telecollaboration, tele Greek for distance collaboration, because I feel that that's the nexus of all of this type of, uh, of, this type of uh, learning environment. In 2021, I seem to have capitulated and in an in a article with a colleague of mine, Margarita Benagre, we talked about virtual exchange, but we put emphasis on it being mutually supported, guided learning between class partners. 2024, it has its own Wikipedia page. Virtual Exchange now has its own Wikipedia page. So in 2045, that we were looking in the future, we need to consider how interaction, how AI will come into interaction with virtual exchange, with all types of educational uh, scenario, scenarios and e ecologies. So I want to look briefly as well as the evolution of these keywords and its focus. In 1993, just around 1% of all communication was via internet. So in the 1990s, keywords were virtual connections, internet and languages and culture, and it was pockets of innovators like Mark Warshauer working on virtual exchange. It was, it was not anything uh, very widespread or mainstream. The focus was on language learning in particular, not too much discussion of anything else. We focus on language learning. Then we have our in in later on, getting later into the 19 in, in the late 1990s, we have keywords that intercultural comes into play, social interaction and dialogue. And at the same time, technology is getting better and better at communicating at me, at computer mediated communication. In the 2000s, when around 50% of the communication in the world is via internet. We've got focus on intercultural learning. Language learning is still there, but there's this recognition that cultures also come into play and more focus on dialogue and debate. And then around 2007, around 90% of communication is via internet. And we have focus is now on task and task design and teacher education, getting teachers ready to deal with these virtual exchanges and becoming more and teachers and students becoming more of the intercultural awareness that is needed to to be able to successfully carry out this type of collaboration in the 20 2020s onward some keywords teachers innovation multilingual multimodal resources 
project-based virtual exchange, linguistic, intercultural, and digital competences. There's this recognition that it's not in, they're not just sitting there in front of a computer. They've got to be able to handle so many different modalities of these com computer-mediated communications. So the focus, again, is on pedagogical competences, teacher innovation, integrated competences, and multilingual, multimodal affordances. Now, I'm going to take just a quick look back at a more anecdotal type of look in the past. Um, but before I do that, I want to point out what we see in, in I'm going to go back, sorry, what we see in common in all of this is with between virtual exchange and AI is accessibility. As the technology becomes more readily available, there's a growing interest and it, be, it moves from just these pockets of maybe Looney Tune innovators and more integrated into classroom practices. And there's more, more and more focus on how pedagogically this can be carried out, this can be done uh, successfully and efficiently and effectively and really support language learning. So uh, just um, one more brief look into the past, uh, 40 years, Museum of Ancient Technology and Education. I want to, I bring, I bring this in to show how virtual exchange projects, this is one of my first pro, pro, virtual exchange projects that I ever supervised. And I want to show you how it was carried out and, and the way that teachers dealt with what was extremely complex situations without the technology available to them. So we built our own platform. This was a platform you can see here. It had it. There were there was no there was n were no platforms available for video conferencing. There was emails. So what this platform we we got money from the EU and built a platform that it integrated Wiki as a home for the children to build a home page. Had they could have text chat, no audio chat, that would have been impossible, and they could very clunkily upload sort of some some uh, different types of uh, files such as audio files and images and whatnot. When we built this, we didn't little did we know that we were we were creating this um, around between 2001 and 2004. Little did we know that there was another uh, group of people inventing a platform that very, very similar in Australia that became Moodle. So I think we lost, we missed our calling. We did not become famous and rich, but anyway, it was, it was enjoyable to do. And so, but the need was there as, as is evidenced by the, the, the innovation that we had to do. We had cutting edge technology, dictionaries, books. Yes, we had to use books, emails, audio blogs, and home pages. So this was the type of technology we were using. And there were very, very few references available on how to do virtual exchange. I think we found uh, 11 total. So we were the blind leading the blind really. So, um, but what was interesting from this experience, what we learned from this experience is that it needed to be with final output, it needed to be project-based. And that was the way that this virtual exchange was going to, to be most effective. So um, this is, this is kind of showing uh, what and how these things get started. And it's also, I want to point out that we were hearing also quite some of the same kind of questions that you're probably hearing as you bring chat GPT into your teaching. Kids need to learn the basics first. Why are you doing this? You know, they're not gonna to wanna to learn traditionally anymore. You're gonna spoil them. This is just a trend. Should we really be doing that in school? So uh, teachers, I have too much work to do to be bothered with this. So these are just still some of the comments that, that you would hear that we were hearing 40 years ago. So it's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's gonna always be there and we need to know how to deal with it. But where are we now? That was 40 years ago. 2024, there are books, websites, associations, conferences, journals that are entirely dedicated to virtual exchange. There are presentations in any education conference you go to. There's now mention of virtual exchange. There are hundreds of thousands of articles. As I said, when we first started out, we could find about 11. It was really, really hard to find any mention of telecollaboration or virtual exchange. Now, poof. 
hundred thousand. You just Google it, and and you 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 could not read them all in one lifetime. AI could probably read them all, but humans cannot, right? So these paradigmatic shifts, what does it have in common with AI? By embracing technology, these teachers, these small pockets of innovation who prioritize the use of technology for learners' well-being and growth, these pockets of innovation, they became shared approaches, created sort of a, what I would call a ripple effect, these concentric circles, ever-expansive circles. Uh, and now it's gone from no one had ever heard of, hardly anyone had heard of virtual exchange in 2004 to 2024. Almost everyone in education has heard it, so much so that there are now some proposals by the European Union that virtual exchange should become compulsory for high school and uh, university learners. So now I'm shifting lanes back to where I started. We have uh, a different report, not the UNESCO from 1956 on uh, teaching machines. We have a 2003 UNESCO report on the guidance for generative AI in education and research. And what I would highlight here is that it is the focus is on human-centered and pedagogically appropriate interaction approach. The need to have humans at the center, human needs, student needs, learner needs, be based on learners' uh, intrinsic motivation and controlled not by AI, but by the humans, the human agents. There are many ways. They also propose that AI should be integrated into facility inquiry or project-based learning which is also very dear to my heart. And I know as well to Dr. Beckett, who is a renowned expert in the, the whole uh, notion of project-based language learning. Um, so the Jinning AI, it doesn't serve as the teacher alone. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tutor or a, an, a research aid to the student, a learning coach, and it's integrated into the whole focus of, uh, of teaching project-based learning. Okay, so I'm preaching to a choir, I know. We, sounds good, totally agree, yeah, okay. But how do we do it? So I'm gonna propose here some potential action points. Embrace AI inter integration with digital literacy. Uh, this has been brought out and I fully concur. AI literacies deserve more attention in language education. Particularly, what are the competencies students are going to need? What are the attitudes? What are the dispositions? We, there's been several talks about this here. Critical AI literacy mentioned by Dr. Godwin Jones in this, in this conference. Student and teacher, not just student preparation, but student and teacher preparation. We need a more informed approach to the development and implementation of AI resources in educational settings. Again, this is already coming up, which I find extremely, extremely motivating and inspirational. Uh, we need research-backed support for the educators and for the policymakers. If policymakers are gonna be pushing something, they need to know that it really works and they need to know how it works and teachers need to know how it works as well. We need to prioritize interdisciplinary critical thinking and problem solving through project-based language learning, integrating AI, AI into uh, pedagogical approaches that promote critical thinking, not just allowing the AI to think for us. And, and there's been several, uh, several presentations in this conference about this. Promote social and emotional learning. Um, this one is gonna be a little bit more difficult. How do we bring AI in here to promote human to interaction? Is it human a to AI to human interaction? What are the dyads? We need to do more research. What are the dyads or triads of interaction that we can really, really uh, look at the ways to promote empathy and, and collaboration through AI? Consider how to make AI use sustainable. This was brought up very, very, very potently uh, by Dr. Darwin yesterday. Uh, Change is needed uh, for because this is not sustainable to use AI, um, and it's just ecologically sustainable. 
um, perhaps one way is to engage students in project-based virtual exchanges that investigate AI. There's an example of that. I'll give it in my references by uh, a, a platform called Unite All, All Schools. So the students around the globe working at, looking at how to make AI sustainable. We need to work to ensure equity and access. There need to be the resources. AI is not going to make education equitable if there's not access to these resources equitable. We also need to look at the power hierarchies that are intrinsic to the AI. Uh, how can we use AI to culturally and to do culturally and linguistically responsive teaching? And we need to incorporate multiliteracies and multilingualism. Um, how can we use AI to, to promote local languages and cultures? Um, how can we support, it can be used to support uh, newcomers' language barriers, but it can also be used perhaps to promote minority languages that are, are less common. Because right now, as I said earlier, AI is being predominantly trained in English. And this needs to be taken into consideration. So again, again, sounds good. But how? The reason I did the timeline is because I want to emphasize how the ripple effect can actually work. We start with grassroots initiatives, small individual actions, as we started back in 1990s with just a few pocket of innovative practices. Those become communities of practice. And then there are inevitable sociocultural shifts as these become more accepted by our parents, by other teachers, and they begin to have a more global impact. Cross-border collaborations, sharing of best practices, and this creates an even bigger ripple effect. And as these ripples grow, they influence larger institutions. We, I just mentioned the EU policy to make virtual exchange mandatory at certain levels in education. This will have a wider societal impact. Uh, we need to be, as communicators, communicators of these practices, not just to our, to our academic world. We need to be getting out there and getting it, giving this the, to other people, to parents, to communities, to policymakers. We can maximize it further by network building, which I'm hoping that those are there in the now at the conference are doing just that. Storytelling and advocacy through conferences like this, but as well getting out into mainstream and making this, making this, uh, giving talks outside of our, our educational community. Looping, getting feedback and adapting and improving what we're already doing. We can't just sit on our logs and assume that we're doing it right. We need to provide proof, evidence-based, we need the research. The research is going on and being displayed right here in this, in this conference. We need to support new activists and support and, sh who share and share this knowledge. And we need to believe that this can be done, that this type of education can be achieved and we can make a difference. So I'm going to make a short a uh, very uh, bald-faced plug for another presentation that's coming up. And I'm going to show a, a short clip of a young activist adventure, which is an AI-enhanced telecollaborative project, which will be presented later on in this project, in this conference. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a news clip These after this conference was over. So you, you'll get an idea of how the project was done. You won't hear very well. You don't need to because it's in Catalan and you can read the subtitles. <laughs> Alumnes de quart de primària de l'Escola Sant Jordi de Mollet i un centre educatiu de Nigèria han fet un treball conjunt. L'objectiu ha estat conscienciar sobre la importància de l'estalvi de l'aigua, tot plegat, a més, utilitzant l'anglès com idioma per comunicar-se. El resultat del treball l'han pogut veure els alumnes acompanyats de les seves famílies. Amb aquesta cançó, cantada conjuntament pels alumnes de l'Escola Sant Jordi i estudiants d'una escola de Nigèria, s'ha posat punt final al projecte que tots dos centres han desenvolupat durant tres mesos. La iniciativa volia tenir en compte diversos elements, 
per un costat, analitzar la situació de sequera actual i plantejar solucions d'estalvi d'aigua. Per exemple, quan esperem que la que perquè la dutxa eh, es calenti, eh, posar un cubell per a l'aigua freda i després reutilitzar-la. I el que podríem fer, per exemple, a les comunitats de Catalunya o d'altres països, eh, potser seria eh, que posessin més pous. Per aquest projecte també s'ha treballat la utilització de la intel·ligència artificial. Vam treballar amb el xat GPT, que li feien moltes preguntes sobre això del projecte de, la, de l'aigua i tot, per saber, el, o sigui, per saber maneres per, per com reduir l'aigua. Els resultats han estat còmics com aquest i tot plegat, mitjançant l'anglès com a llengua principal. Fent un lloc adinant de què país i ciutat eren. Ha sigut molt divertit, entretenent, i eh, ha sigut molt bo, molt, molt original. El projecte va començar fa tres mesos i la cloenda s'ha fet amb la presència de les famílies dels alumnes. Tots han estat estudiants de quarta primària. Amb grups han desenvolupat diferents propostes per conscienciar sobre l'estalvi d'aigua. Aquesta aventura que li vam dir Young Activist, on el nostre alumnat es va, es va convertir en activistes petits, eh, però amb molta força, amb moltes ganes de fer coses noves i tenir un impacte a la societat i en el món actual, que necessita de grans canvis i de grans accions. Sempre s'han esforçat molt a parlar en anglès, tant amb mi com amb els nens de Nigèria, per tant hi ha aquest, aquest concepte de la comunicació eh, en anglès, la competència comunicativa. A l'acte també s'ha projectat una obra de teatre que han fet els alumnes de Nigèria. A l'escola sempre, sempre apostem per projectes innovadors i la nostra companya Maria Mont va sorgir aquesta oportunitat i vam pensar que era una oportunitat fantàstica per als nens i nenes. Un cop fetes les presentacions, famílies i alumnes han deixat els seus missatges per la posteritat en defensa de la conservació de l'aigua. So as you can see, this was a global project, virtual exchange, project-based. There was integration of AI technology. It was an integrated effort. It was collaborative effort. Multimodal learning, global connections and intercultural awareness came in. Uh, respond, there was a response to changing social situations and needs. There was an impact beyond the classroom, which will be explained in the presentation coming up. There was social and emotional learning, and it was very inclusive. And I'm going to take just a, a, a little side uh, bar here to say that um, there was a, a student with special needs. And at one point, he be he was so engaged, so much more engaged in the learning that was taking place in this in this project than they had witnessed in all the four in the four years he'd been at school. That at one point the monitor that stays with him had to leave the classroom. She was in tears. She was emo so emotional about how responsive this child was during this whole project. So I, I just wanted to mention that there were parents who came up to us with tears in their eyes at the end after the presentation of this project. So there was social and emotional learning as well, I believe. Um, if you want to know more, stick around for the session. <laughs> so winding up, this conference, Technology for Second Language Learning, had a, a call that there's new imperatives and possibilities presented by generative AI. It calls for research that offers immediate guidance and builds new knowledge about language use, language learning, and language assessment. I think that this has been well met here. I congratulate everyone here that is that are presenting things. I think that you're that we are, I'll include myself here, in those pockets of innovation that we're striving to be one of those first little pebbles in the ripple effect of water and I believe we can do it. I believe that it is our responsibility and we need to ensure that this student in the 2045 has the education she needs, that we control how the AI is integrated into education, that it's not decided by technicians, by AI entrepreneurs or AI businessmen, it's us as educators with always the learners in mind. And with that,
I say thank you very much. And if you're interested in my references, you can either uh, scan them or copy them on the, the right there with the with the URL code. I don't know. Should I leave it up for just a few minutes or? Yes. And questions, comments? Did I finish in time? I think I did, right? <laughs> Yes. Uh, as someone, I'm embarrassed to say, who had a chapter in that 1995 or book, uh, <laughs> I, I, I've been a supporter and practitioner of, of virtual exchange for a long time. And um, in today's environment with AI, we you know AI can do a lot of things to help students learn a language. But one of the things, and we, we had a panel of uh, colloquium this morning, on the limitations in terms of developing interactional competence um, and strategic competence and pragmatic abilities with language, uh, AI, chatbots are very limited. Um, and I'm just trying to say the virtual exchange. I'm sorry, I, I apologize. You cut, I got, you got cut off right there. I didn't hear part of the question, sorry. Virtual exchange, uh, to my mind, complements uh, what AI can provide because it, it enables students to have a real world experience where they are going to have to learn <laughs> interactional competence. And, you know, in my experience, one of the great benefits of uh, virtual exchange has been a lot of my students develop uh, long-term relationships with the students with whom they have exchanges. So that's also not something that AI can supply. So it's I, I agree with you completely that the virtual exchange is so important, much more so now with, with AI than ever before. Yes, yes. I do worry a bit about um, how we're gonna use it. I mean, I think that's the, that was the message I was trying to, to get across there is that, um, we need to be careful how 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 we use. We need to see it as a tool, uh, but I do think that it can be integrated, uh, as we'll explain in in more detail about the project that uh, I briefly mentioned here. Uh, we, the whole focus was on integrating it rather than just relying on it. So, um, well, thank you. I'm very honored to have you in the in my audience. <laughs> I can't see you see you very well. If you could just say who you are. Bob Godwin Jones. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, um, there you have an example of that for one of those first pebbles in that ripple effect. You know, look where we are now. So, thank you very much for getting the initiative started on virtual exchange. Yes. Um, I, I don't know if there was a question in in what you said though. No, just a comment. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Other questions? Oh, there's one on Zoom. Okay. Oh. Okay. All right. So the question from Zoom is by um, Riazi asking, how do you, how do you see historical US. US policies, such as the um, Telecommunications Act of 1996, signed by President Clinton, uh, including today's educational technology landscape, and integration of AI in language learning. Okay, uh, US policies, did I hear that correctly? US policy. <laughs> US policies. I, I'm going to admit, I grew up in the US, but I left when I was 21 and have not lived in the US since then. That's been, I don't know, two or three years. Uh, not too many. Uh, I've always I've lived more years outside of the U.S. than in, so I'm definitely not an expert on U.S. policy. Uh, I didn't quite catch which which policy you were referring to. Did you say Clinton policy? Six uh, policy signed by President Clinton. Oh goodness! Uh, to, uh, to be honest, um, telecommunications policy. Yeah, uh, I think 
this is what I was trying to say earlier is that I think um, sometimes it's sort of a knee reflex to the technology that comes out. There's different reactions to technology. Sometimes it's decades before it becomes part of the classroom. Remember, we were all watching videos at home long before videos became part of teaching in schools. And now, you know, I mean, that's that's seen as old school. Uh, virtual reality has been around for, for quite some time now and it's not that integrated. So obviously there's some, some, some part of it is the expense of the materials, obviously. But sometimes uh, it's seen as, as well, like I said, this placebo, this, this, this silver bullet that's going to cure everything. The teaching machine that I showed you from 1965 was plugged as going to be the cure for all of these these the 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 ills of education that students were dropping out and that students uh, weren't learning what they needed to learn so I think policy sometimes goes hand in hand with what's occurring in the social political changes um I do think feel like educators do not have the voice they deserve that educators should be saying to policymakers what and what we what are the needs and how these can be met with the technology that exists as well as the technology that needs to exist we should be in in contact with uh technological entrepreneurs to tell them you know what you, that's great what you've invented but what i really need is this you know uh i i i was trying to get that message across as well is that i feel like we need to go out of our comfort zone and be talking to people that maybe we don't have the same language right um we the, our idea of task is definitely not the same as what a computer a uh, computer programmer thinks of as a task. I discovered that after two hours of a meeting with a computer uh, expert, computer analyst, uh, sorry, programmer, and a bottle of wine between the two of us. It, we needed that to be able to find a common language. Um, so getting out, so we need to be able to ex explain the real needs of education because too often our voice is not heard by the public clamor of what people think should be going on in education. I don't think I answered your question, but um, uh, that's, uh, again, I'm not an expert on uh, US policy, even though I did grow up in the US. Um, sorry that I can't answer your question better than that, <laughs> my apologies. It is a very good question, uh, but I do think policies and uh, practices Often, often they're in, they're they're they go hand in hand. Often they're lockstep, and sometimes they're not. Uh, and and I think that the, the best way to to mitigate that circumstance is that educators uh, do have more of a voice. Yeah. There's uh, there are uh, oh, a lot of questions. The first one, <laughs> first to the last one. Uh, do you see English language as an endangered language in the near future? Uh, to be honest, no. <laughs> um, I, I think I can understand. I know that there's a more and more interest in Chinese language, for example. Uh, obviously, you know, we all know the, the famous saying that um, um, a majority language is the one that has an army behind it right um so english is still very much there there's there's a debate that i won't go into here whether it's english english is a lingua franca english is a global language uh how we term the term that use but i don't see english becoming a minor you know a minoritized language in any time soon i live in a in a place where there are languages that are in danger. And so I, I just don't see English being even close to that situation, no. Um, AI may have something, you know, may, we may find a way that AI can actually support minority languages. I think that's an area of research that needs to be, uh, needs to be, uh, deserves more look, uh, more interest. Um, We've got a question. Uh, okay. Um, Raising their hand. Jean, I can you can Jean ask her own question? Is it long? I told Jean. Hi. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, 
Very interesting. I want to preface my response with saying I am not an educator. Um, I'm actually a sign language interpreter. Um, so I found this very interesting. Uh, I do believe that AI and VE are going to be uh, very important in education. I see pieces of this now. I do a lot of um, educational interpreting, like college level, university level, and I see it already starting to be integrated. Um, my concern is how they're actually going to achieve equity. You know, it sounds great what they say, but at this point, AI generated closed captions sometimes are incomprehensible, for example. I know they've been working on AI language systems to try to uh, have ASL, but the computers still can't read human produced ASL. So there are groups I can see being left out of the equation. You know, making internet access available to all is wonderful, but if you don't have the resources to get the hardware to access it, it's not gonna help you. Um, so I'm curious how they foresee actually providing this equity. Oh, uh, again, wow, that's an excellent question. And it's also something that I pointed out that I don't see the equity. These were predictions, not my predictions. They were predictions from other resources. Uh, and I do have my doubts about whether equity, you know, in 2045 is actually going to be around. Uh, I would hope in more time, I think, again, it's... Uh, goes back to the question of the policies. Um, it, uh, I'm definitely not an expert on sign language or anything like that. Uh, I'm, first, I want to make a comment on you saying that it's incomprehensible. Um, my admiration for your, for your job, by the way. Um, I wonder if sometimes I, when I hear things like, well, it's incomprehensible still, the interpretation is not well, I wonder how different that is from actual human inter interaction sometimes, you know, because you can be in situations where you don't understand anything anybody's saying to you, right? So I, I, I'm sorry, I, I just want to make a comment. If you, have, if you watch a YouTube video with AI generated captions, mm -hmm. um, it leaves out half of, a half of sentence. Uh, wow. I'm sorry, okay. that was not English. Half of a sentence. So you won't have a complete thought. Right. You'll have word. It doesn't recognize homophones. So sometimes right. you'll get completely the wrong word. Um, so human interaction, at least we can make mm -hmm. those fixes or you right. could exactly. kind of make those interpretations. It's not happening with the AI captions and the deaf who rely on it are often missing large chunks of the information that's being put out there. Um, so the AI com um, captions truly are incomprehensible. Just try to follow a movie with the captions and you'll see. Right, right. I, I can I can see how that would be a very serious problem. Uh, I am in education. I'm definitely not an expert in AI. And I would go back to what I said earlier. I think that it needs to be the voices of the, the teachers, the students, uh, people like yourself who see what is needed, what is needed. Uh, so do we really need all these AIs generating f uh, funny little cats wearing Google, you know, wearing, wearing a heart, having hearts in their eyes and things like that? Do we need more focus on AI becoming an efficient interpreter for, for uh, students who have uh, hearing problems? Um, I think that that's, that's what I was saying when I was talking about the ripple effect. We have to be advocates. We need to be advocates for for the the people we're working with and for our learners and and so um, I I think in a way when I said it's our responsibility to be make sure that that young girl that we were visualizing in twenty forty five that she's got the education she needs um, I, mean, I think it's our it's our role what is the way to do that I'm sorry I don't have the answer it's a bit like what we were saying that when we start out with these pockets of innovation, you test and you try and you say that works, that doesn't, and you keep working and then you share and you create communities of practice and you make changes that way. So. Okay, thank you very much for this insight. Uh, talk. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I hope I didn't bore everyone to tears. <laughs> I'm sorry about all 
about not being able to ask all the wonderful questions that you posted online. Um, Can you, could you send me a copy of this and maybe I could uh, address them? Oh, somehow. yeah, sure. Yeah, you oh, can. you can see it on your... Um, yeah, but after we, I don't know, I wouldn't have it saved and there's no way I can address all these right now. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. But but, uh, but any anybody who wants to continue okay I'm I'll save the chat yes yeah. thank you <laughs> anyone who wants to continue the discussion is welcome to stay for the social time here um, oh. in, at Iowa State we are going to have our lunch but this is okay <laughs> and the uh, um, social come back uh, for our presentation <laughs> uh, will be open let me just remind you one more thing and that is that the voting. Um, for the posters, the best poster ends at one o'clock. So that's one hour. Oh, now it's only 55 minutes from now <laughs> that, the, that the voting is going to close. So if you haven't voted, please do so because we're going to announce the winner in during the closing at the end of the day. Now we can go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank Melinda. You. I'm just great. I'm so, I really enjoyed your presentation. Yeah. Oh, hey, um, you just froze on me. I don't know if you hear me. I just want to say thank you again for, oh. for listening. Thank you. See you. Not chance. Yeah, 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 all right, she needs a break. <laughs> 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 <laughs>